of things. One of them is just wrong. The other one is wrong but common. The other one is common and needs maybe more work than an alternative. I'll say it that way. All right, so the, the first thing that's just wrong is to take this and for your next step to look something like this. 7x minus 28 squared minus 18. wrong with it? Um, you don't know what's wrong with it? Uh, it's just so wrong you gotta shake your head at it? I don't know. I'm not sure. Gavin? You're supposed to um, um, square the x minus 4 before you multiply it before you put the 7 and distributing it with like, the like multiplying it. You see the like multiplying the x minus 4 instead of squaring it first? Okay. That'd be good. Yeah. Sort of. Uh, I think you're, yeah, you're not recognizing that that, that is a two sets of parentheses, x minus four times x minus four. Let's uh, let's write what that really is. It's seven times x minus four times x minus four. Now, now that we've written it for what it is, we could distribute the seven to this set of parentheses, but not not this one. Um, that'd be fine. We could choose to multiply these together first two, and then take the result to multiply by seven, but. If we distribute the seven just into that, and we write it as the square, it's like we have seven x minus 28 times seven x minus 28. Um, we can get one, one factor of seven x minus 28 and then x minus four, but not two of them. So trying to distribute that seven like that is, a, is wrong, that's a no-no for sure. Um, the other thing, write it as x minus 4 times x minus 4. And then, you know, you do it correctly, but this is the thing that I wouldn't advise because now you're going to have 7 times x squared uh, minus 8x plus 16 minus 18 equals 10. And then we have to distribute the 7, and then we have to uh, combine like terms with the negative 18. And then we just subtract 10 on both sides, the end equals 0, then we have to factor it. Set each factor equals zero and solve each of those. That's a lot of work. If that was as much work as you need to do, what you need to do, if it's what you did and found the right solutions, then more power to you. But maybe I can remind you of something that's a little faster, a little easier. Um, factoring is kind of a drag, right? Uh, to try and factor things out, to try to factor out a quadratic, it can be kind of difficult. So um, just try and avoid it. Um, well, I'll just put it to the room. Without having to do that, what's another idea that we could take advantage of? You could add the eight to the ten. Uh huh. Twenty-eight, and then we would divide the seven from the eight. We just divide both sides by yeah. seven. Divide this by seven, you cancel out the seven. Divide this by seven, you get four. And then square root both. Square root both sides. That's golden nugget right there. You take the square root of both sides. Now we don't have to worry about first multiplying it all out, which is its own little chore, then factoring it, which um, this one is factorable, but it's also kind of a bear because we've got the 7x out front, or the 7 out front, we're going to have a 7x squared, which means we've got to use our AC method to factor it. And uh, yeah, it could be really bothered. But instead, we leave it in the square root and we just use the square to get this really simple x minus four on this side. And what do we get with the square root of four? Two. Plus so minus two. Four plus or minus two. Minus four. Plus or minus two. Okay. What does this mean? Plus or minus two equations where it would be either positive two or yeah. negative two. Right, it just represents two equations, one with We don't have to write both of those. We can just recognize it means that two things need to happen. We need to add three and subtract two. Right. Uh, so when we add four to both sides, add four, add four. We just need to remember we need to do two things: four plus two. Right. This is four plus or minus two. Kind of do it like this. When you add two, you get six. When you subtract two, you get two. Now that's just a little 
reminder, right? You, you solve the equation of length based on this on the quiz. Do you use square roots? Or did we? No, we didn't. No, we just learned that. But it's a reminder of that section, 4.5. Agreed? All right. The quiz has been a little wild, so we need a little refresher. All right. So the just this golden idea is having a quantity squared and taking the square root of it. Would you rather take the square root of that quantity, or would you rather multiply it out and then have to factor it afterwards? Square root. What's that? Square root. You like the square root? Square yeah. root's nice. Square root cancel out the square. It's good and clean. Yeah. You might remember from that section, from that homework, that sometimes you come out with square roots of like square root of seven halves or something like that, but that's all right. You wouldn't have been able to solve that anyway if we were trying to use factoring. And so now it's possible to So this is the big, big deal here, that we take the square root of both sides. Um, but it, it really is not usable in any situation other than we have parentheses squared, right? But what we're going to learn today is how to take any quadratic and make it written this way, to write it in a way we have parentheses squared, and then we can take the square root advantage of that square root idea. Okay, so that's what we're going to learn. Um, it's called completing the square. It's not a, not a bad name. All right. Well, just before we get into all that, we're going to take a little quick pit stop in 4.6 and learn about some new kinds of numbers. Because what we're about to do in 4.7, 4.7, we're going to make every quadratic possible to factor. Um, and when we do that, we're going to uh, possibly come up across these new numbers, yeah? Are we going to have as much time? We're going to have as much time as we have after we're all done, which should be good if we're all firing all, all cylinders, okay? I think, uh, I think the last class had about 15 minutes. And if you're even better than them, then you're going to have more time. All right, so first I want you to try your hand at solving that equation, using the idea of square root. Try at some point to take the square root of both sides. stuff out there, feel free to subtract and four from both sides. And then take the square root of both sides. And then now, now comes the question. What's the square root of negative four? Um, I square root of Yeah, that's true. Okay. But probably most of us haven't looked uh, yeah. ahead, right? Yeah. But you're right. Yeah? What's that? Negative. Negative two. Well, right. It couldn't be two because two times two is four. Is it negative two? It's a good uh, instinctual thought. But um, if if negative two is the square root of negative four, that means we should be able to take negative two times negative two, right? Times itself and get negative four. But negative two times negative two is also positive four. Plus or minus two just means either positive or negative two when you multiply it by itself. Will it's not positive and negative two. It's so really positive or negative two means it like it breaks it up into two answers. X equals two, x equals negative two. Okay. That would work if it was uh, x equals the square root of four. Yeah. But it's not as negative four. And what we go back to is then we'll go back to this idea that it's negative two. If that didn't work out, negative two times negative two is positive. Um, now 
time we're just fresh out of ideas. We had positive two doesn't work, negative two doesn't work. There's some other kind of number that you can multiply by itself to get a negative number. Well, the answer is yes, but let's say. Imaginary. Yeah, imaginary. It requires imaginary numbers, okay? And here's why they're called imaginary numbers because there is no number, let's say we don't know what the imaginary numbers are. What we've been using are we call them real numbers. And there's no number that I can think of that when you multiply by itself gives you a negative. Because you got positives. Positive times positive is positive. Negative. Negative times negative is also positive. So there's, there's just no number that you can multiply it by itself to get a negative number. Okay? So we have to come up with a new kind of number. There's no real numbers, but maybe there's a, another kind of number that can multiply by itself. Okay. So we'll go back. We'll, we'll Take all the way down to the most basic uh, example of an imaginary number. And that would be when we solve this equation. So we do the same way, subtract one from both sides, x equals square root of negative one. I mean, we wrote that much already over here. X would be the square root of negative four. I just don't have a way to really talk about that. Um, so the, like the simplest negative number I can think of square root of is, is negative one. That's why it's like the basis of the whole imaginary number system. Okay. So that's it. That, that's what we call it. The square root of negative one is it. It is the basis of the, of the uh, imaginary number system. And that's kind of what we say. We just kind of use the square root of negative one as if it were another number. Okay. And I'll show you why we'd even bother in just a minute. Um, but one thing we could do now is we could write this using this imaginary number. Uh, we can make it the square root of four times the square root of negative one. Is that the same? Because we can pull apart those square roots into their own two square roots as a factor of two numbers. Okay, and uh, we should really be doing a plus or minus, right? Plus or minus. Plus or minus the square root of four is two times the square root of negative one. Does that make sense? All we did there is just take negative four, make it four times negative one, give it our own square roots. Now we use the square root of four part of it like it was always normally, just take two times this other square root of negative one thing, we'll just kind of leave it to the side, push it over to the side, and, and just let it tag along with the whole problem. So here's a number, 2 times the square root of negative 1. It's a, it's a weird number, but let's just see what happens when we multiply it by itself. Uh, 2, 2 times the square root of negative 1, times 2 times the square root of negative 1. Okay. Well, this is just all multiplied together. We could just do 2 times 2. 2 times 2 is uh, 4. Right? Then we have the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1. Negative one equals negative four. We're going to kind of talk about this a little more in depth in just a second. If you're thinking this should be positive one, if you're not thinking this should be positive one, great, you're on board and no problems there. If you think it should be positive one, uh, hopefully I can clear that up for you. I can do a little better about that. This is it, this is the basis, square root of negative one. It is, just like one is the, the basis of, of all the other real numbers, you start adding it and you divide it by the, you know, all this different stuff and you start getting all the other numbers, square root of negative one is the basis. So if we're gonna be writing this a bunch, we'll, let's save ourselves some time and some ink and some energy and not write all of that at once, we just call it I. And, uh, and all the times that I've seen I written when we're talking about the imaginary number I, um, it's written like kind of curly and like italicized. Okay? It's like the standard. If you write that curly italicized I like this, then that's what you're talking about. We're talking about the imaginary number square root of negative one. Okay? So today is the day we have we. 
So like I said, I'm going to show you why we would even bother. Why would we bother having the square root of negative 1 tag along with the solutions um, rather than just saying, hey, there's no real numbers that work, so what's it matter? Um, one reason that it matters is when we take these, these uh, imaginary numbers, when we take these imaginary numbers and multiply them by themselves, let's see what happens. This is i squared. Well, what, what is i again? 1. Not 1. one. It's one. the square, square root of negative 1. We just a name we gave to this most basic square root of a negative number. All right, so we take these two imaginary numbers and multiply them together. They're just the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1. We take the square root of something times the square root of something. Get that. Square root of 2 times square root of 3 is 2. Square root of 3 times square root of 3 is 3. Everybody at peace with that? Square root of negative 1 times square root of negative 1 is negative 1? Anybody feel like it should be positive 1? You feel like it should be positive 1? Yeah. I did too. Okay? And here, here's why someone might feel that, and let me just make you feel a little better about it. Okay? Um, so we could like write these together in the same square root. It seems like we should be able to multiply those together. We have 1, square root of 1 of 4. Okay. Um, but keep in mind, like if we said the square root of 1, we'd really consider both. Right? The square root of 1 is plus or minus 1. And we're, we're saying that because it's kind of a mystery. What did we what did we what can we multiply together to get the number 1? Well, we could do plus 1 or minus 1. Either one of those will work. But up here, we we, we write that because we don't know what we multiply together to get positive 1, but here, we kind of see behind the scenes, we are multiplying specifically negative 1 times negative 1. So the number we want to multiply by itself is negative 1 specifically. So we know it's actually this guy right here. It's the negative that we multiply together. Okay. It's a little easier to be convinced of it if you just read a bit like this and think, oh, the square root of the square root multiply together. This in my head, you know, when I was learning about I, and then thought, why isn't it one? Why isn't it one? Well, we're not saying negative one times negative one is negative one. The square root of, uh, or negative one times negative one is one, right? Now, if if you didn't, if you never saw that, and you saw this, what we're saying is we have one, and we're going to figure out by saying the square root, what we're going to figure out is what number times itself gave us that positive 1. right? Since we never saw this, we just kind of have to let all possibilities be included, so we just say plus or minus 1. But we see how the positive 1 was obtained by multiplying negative 1 times negative 1. So negative 1 is the number we multiply by itself to get that specific one. Okay? Well, we can... Uh, Multiply i times i times i. Can I write this as i squared times i? Sure, this is just <coughs> i times i times i. I can put two of those i's together as i squared and then multiply by the third i. What's i squared? Negative 1 times i, negative i. So it pretty much never changes. Uh, if, you, if you allow it times it by itself, like it will just always stay negative i. Well, no, this isn't negative i. This is negative 1. This is negative i. This is negative 1. This is a real number. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's why. I squared, oh, that's got real. When we multiply the two i's together, what kind of a number is i? I alone is imaginary, but when you start multiplying i times i, you get back to the real number. Now, I to the fourth. Now we're going to start to see it come full circle. 
I to the fourth we could write as I squared times I squared. What's I squared? Negative one. one. Negative one times negative, negative one. one is one. Okay. So I squared is negative one. I to the third is negative I. So we're back into the imaginary. So we have to multiply it by an imaginary number again. Get out of the fourth. <coughs> that is two one, the positive one. So if we multiply I times I times I times I, now we've taken the imaginary number, just multiplied it by itself four times, and we got positive one, the basis of a real number. And what happens here is if we do i to the fifth, now we can write that as i to the fourth times i. And we just did i to the fourth. What's i to the fourth? One. One times i. Negative the i. So i to the fifth just comes all the way back around, and it's i again. And so if we then we can multiply that by some stuff, and we're either going to wind up with negative one, negative i, one, or back to i again. So if we had like i to the 17th, well that must boil down somehow. We can see how this cycling is cycling through. It must boil down to one of these. Well, if we can make it the simplest, like break it down into the simplest of all of these, and that is where we get one. That's where we have i to the fourth. So we can do i to the fourth times 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 i. Because we just add all these exponents together and we multiply these things that have the same base. So we have i to the fourth to the eighth to the twelfth to the sixteenth, and then one more is to the seventeenth. Well, what's i to the fourth? One. One times one times one times one times i. And it's just i. So any not numbers that you're squaring it by, it's going to equal i. Any what now? Like when you take um, an odd J power and then you try to power it and stuff like that, and, and it's a power to an odd number, it's always going to equal i. Well, here's an odd power, though, and we get negative i. So I guess we could say if it's an odd power, it will either come out to be negative i or i. I don't know. And if it's an even power, it will come out to be 1 or negative 1. So this could be written as i to the 16th times i. What do you notice about 16? Even. Even, it's also divisible by 4. So if we had i to the uh, 30th power, well, if we, if we take i to the 4th and multiply by itself a bunch of times, we're just going to get something that, a power that's divisible by 4. So how about if we just look for a number that's divisible by 4 but is less than 30? 28. And then we have i to the second left over. Well, this is just a bunch of i to the fourths multiplied together, and i to the fourth is one. It's one times one times one times one times one times one. Seven ones multiplied together times i squared, which is negative one. Sorry, all of these uh, imaginary numbers we can write like this: a plus b times i, where a and b, both a and b, the number that you multiply by i, they're both real numbers. A and b are real numbers. Now this number, since you're multiplying it by an imaginary number, this whole number together when you multiply it is the imaginary. This part is just all real, so that's the real part. So you got the real part and the imaginary part. Any complex number can be represented this way. So we take this guy and multiply it by this guy here. Two complex numbers, two numbers that have Them together, we're going to get, well, why don't you just do that? Why don't you just multiply those together? You already know how to do it. Treat i like it was a variable. Is i a variable? Yes. No. No. It's what? It's an imaginary number. It is actually the imaginary number, the imaginary number, or the 
the imaginary unit is what? Multiply it out, you get 3 times 2, 6. 3 times negative 4 is negative 12i. 3 is done, 3 is distributed all the way through. Move over to 6i. 6i times 2 is 12i. Uh, and then 6i times negative 4i. What do you think 6i times negative 4i is? Just go through this thing. Six minus twelve i plus twelve i, so those happen to cancel each other out. Um, and then we have minus twenty four i squared. won't always happen. Like if, if these aren't opposites, uh, then you'll have an i part left over too. But uh, just make sure you take that i squared piece and turn it into negative one. If you have an i to the third, well then i to the third is really uh, negative i. Okay. Right. That way, there's no reason to have anything in your final uh, complex number other than a plus bi, some sort of a unique one. Okay, you can boil it all down to a real piece and then an i to the first power times something. Well, that's 4.6. That's all the imaginary stuff. Right? The imaginary numbers. That's how the imaginary number system works. If you're going to add them together, I mean, they they really effectively work like you're doing like terms, right? That is kind of how they are. You, you can only imagine, add imaginary numbers to imaginary numbers. You can only add real numbers to real numbers. Um, so if you have, for instance, 5 plus 2i minus 3 plus 6i, you just distribute this negative here, minus 3 minus 6i. You only put the imaginary parts together and the real parts together. 3 minus 2, or 5 minus 3 is 2. And 2i minus 6i, which is equal to 4i. You subtracted one complex number from another one. So I would say follow your instincts on that for the most part. You're going to go down the right path. Uh, i is going to act a lot like a variable. It's not a variable. It is a number, um, but because it's a number, it represents a number, and numbers combine the way that numbers do. They, when you write square, it means you're multiplying it by itself, and so on. Um, it's going to be fine as long as you remember that i squared and i to the third, and anything with that's i to some higher power uh, can be simplified. Just remember that. Okay. So now we we come to four point seven, and just to reiterate what I.
I said earlier, what I said we're going to do. Let's go back to this first thing we did today. We solved the quadratic with a big idea, big golden nugget was taking the square root of both sides. So much easier than factoring, setting factor to zero. What if it didn't factor in the first place? Now we can't solve it. So now we're going to take any quadratic, and by that I mean like quadratics that we might see in 4.3 and 4.4, those ones. Let's take a look at those and we'll be reminded of what those were. Um, we'll take ones like that, and we can take any one of those and make it look like a quadratic from 4.5, where there's a parenthesis squared. And it, just, it, it just comes down to manipulating it so that you can do that and So let's start out with one that factors just like that. x squared plus 3x plus 16. So just really quickly factor that and remind yourself um, yeah, factor all that kind of stuff. But notice how it factors perfectly. to make 16 and add to make 8. So what two numbers? Three, four. You just use 4 and also 4. Right? And I say it factors perfectly. It factors into a perfect square. x plus 4 times itself we divide as x plus 4 squared. Of course, I've set this up ideally, but you can imagine if this were part of an equation, then you know, we could get this thing by itself and take the square root, just like we did in that first example of the day. Um, that was ideal, though. What, what happens when it's x squared plus 8x plus 12? Does this factor? How does it, it doesn't factor the way we want it to, but does it factor? How does it factor? 62. X plus 6 times x plus 2. That's not what we wanted. We didn't want that at all. So uh, what's different about this one compared to that one? It's now the perfect square. Yeah, when it factors with the perfect square, what, what's different about how it starts out? The last number is different. The last number is different. Apparently, if this number were like just right, it would factor the way we want it to. Okay. Um, we can see it does that when it's 16. 16, that works out really nicely. Do you think any other number besides 16 would work? If, if we first have x squared plus 8x, do you think any other number besides 16 would work? Because it would factor some other perfect square, right? Just gonna, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that 12. So I'm going to say, once again, one, one more time I'll ask the question. Do you think that any other number besides 16 Two eights is going to be sixteen. Uh, just I'm, I'm a little bit confused by your your phrasing. Well, those are the numbers greater than eight on sixty-six cubed. Greater than eight. So like greater than sixteen. When we factor it, uh, when we factor, if we were to multiply those factors out, 
something we do know. We don't know what this is, but we do know that what would have to happen? It has to equal 8. It has to equal 8. So let's think about that. We're going to multiply these two things together, and we have to get 8. Well, there's lots of ways to get 8, right? 6 plus 2. That's not all. There's one more thing that we want to have happen. Like, what do we want to be true about these two factors? That be a perfect square. Be a perfect square. We want to write it as x plus whatever that is, or minus whatever it turns out to be squared, which means that these two numbers are going to be the same. same. So we need two numbers that add to eight and are also the same. There are lots of ways to do that. There's only one way to. Fours. It's got to be 4 and 4. There's no other way to take two identical numbers and add it to make 8. If your 3 doesn't work, if your 2 doesn't work, only 4 is the right answer. Okay. Well, since we know that, we know that we have to add to make 8, so that we know that how it's going to factor is going to be x plus 4 times x plus 4. This number, then, would have to be 6. This number times this number, which is 3. So let's start with that. Let's start with the, the practice of handpicking that perfect C value. And by, by C, I mean we have AX squared plus BX plus C, the constant value. Um, and it'll just be a blank, and we're going to just pick the perfect one to uh, come to the square. Do you have thoughts of who's the square now? We wind up with a square. We're missing a piece. We're missing that perfect piece. We're completing it. Yeah. Um, so. So let's just put it out there. What is that number? One. one. So what we want to get to is like um, little. Sure, I don't mind shortcuts if we make up the shortcuts and we use the shortcuts. We make up. Okay, it's way better that way. Um, so how did you know that had to be eighty-one? Why did you divide it? said that, but she just defined it. A number plus itself gives you 18. We're going to talk about half of 18. So we take half of 18. That must be the number that we're putting there. And when we multiply it out, the half of 18, so we multiply it by itself. What is 8? So if we had like x squared plus bx plus c, and we wanted to, well, 
let's not call it C. Let's like write a little formula for finding C. If we have B, in this case B was 18, what are we going to do with B in order to find C? 2B? 2B? Half of B, that's all right. Uh, we'll, we'll write it. What I think we've been thinking of a different way. Yeah. We'll look at that in just a second. One half of B squared equals two. Right? Yeah. So we'll just put that guy right there. B over two squared. Or if we think of it differently, so think about uh, what B is. This number right here. Will any other number besides a perfect square do? Well, some kind of a square, right? Kind of a square. It's going to be the result of multiplying a number, multiplying a number by itself, like the exact copy. So it must be something squared. And I don't want to use b again because that'd be confusing. So um, uh, uh, let's say m squared. It's some number that's squared. That number that's squared, which we know is going to come from x. So what's this number going to be in front of x? One. One? Why one? Well, this is like a blank. We don't like. But it's going to come from when we multiply these together, right? It comes from when we multiply, or not multiply, but add these two together. Yeah. Right. When we add nine to nine, we get eighteen. Um, so it's going to be m plus m, which is 2m. You can look at it any way. I, I think this way works well because what we're going to be given is x squared plus something x. We're going to take that something, divide it by 2, square it, and there you go, b squared over 4. That's what that would be, b squared over 4. So if you like, there you go. It's a shortcut, we, but we invented it. Or um, another thing you could do is you know that like it's going to have to factor uh, into identical factors. You know that this number is going to have to be half of that. So you put those numbers there. You multiply them together. You get 81. So it's the exact same thing that that is saying. But what if we had something like a 15 x? You know, like what's going to go right there? In fact, let's even.
just thought that um, maybe I might put plus 15 and uh, made it 30x and then uh, stuff in and then, and then uh, find something that was between that and divided by 2. So it makes 225. You tried to make this uh, something better than negative 15. Mm -hmm. The only problem with that is like, There needs to be negative 15 x's. We can't change that, right? Yeah. And then if we start to like change this to 30 x, then we have to have like some other x's to balance that out, so that we don't have anything other than like if we were to add everything together, mm -hmm. anything other than negative 15 x. Uh, and then even if that worked out, then this other stuff that would combine with the whatever that is nicer, mm -hmm. then we're going to kind of mess up our factorization. Oh, yeah. With a stray x value over. Here. So I was just trying to find a, uh, it's not bad. I mean, try to make this a better value to work with, but then, like I said, if, you, messed with that, other if things you did uh, make this 30x, 30x, well, we need to wind up with negative 45, or negative 15x, mm -hmm. otherwise we've just changed it. So we could subtract 45x, 30x minus 45x is negative 15x. Did you get back to the original equation? Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, we need, yeah, and, and, and this does work out nicely so that this is 225, and this does work out so that it's x plus 15 squared, but we still have this minus 45x, like, yeah, like the storm is coming, and negative 45x is outside of the shelter, it's scary, like we in here with the rest of his friends. So we don't really want to mess with that, we got to leave that as is. Six and one fourth. I'm gonna make us make it a fraction. Yeah. A fraction. So how did you do it then? Let's um, let's do it the same way, but we'll wind up with a fraction. I put negative fifteen and b to b. That's it. So negative fifteen is b, and what do we do with Over b? Over two. Over two. Um, squared. And squared. So that is just negative fifteen. Plus, right, negative times negative is positive, so it looks like this number will always be positive. Right? Because whether whether we divide this by two and we get a positive or we get a negative, what we're gonna do next is square it. So it should also be well, always be positive. So I guess it's 225 over 4. 225 over 4. And how's that gonna affect? It's not a nice number, it's an odd number. You can still divide it by two. It's definitely like a fraction thing. Still though, if this were involved in a, an equation, it's not so bad, I take the square root of it, mm -hmm. add 15 halves to both sides at the end, and it doesn't look great, but there it is, it's done, it's solved. Let's do one more, uh, make it an easy one, see if we can uh, break it down quickly. N squared plus 16 N plus 64. Um, oh, I think that's what I meant to do. <laughs> a mixture of mixtures. Okay, let me do it. <laughs>
negative 22. Negative 22, so um, to get, and that'd be uh, x minus 1. The x minus 1? Like x? It's negative 11. Yeah, negative 11. Yeah. What do we do with that? And then you take it to, and then you take it to uh, times 11. Times itself? This isn't 11. This is negative 11. Negative 11 times negative 11. So it's positive. Positive 1 times 1. I just thought that, that when you do that and stuff, you had to, because the negative, negative uh, 22, I thought you had to have a negative and a positive. Right, but think about how it's going to factor. x minus 11 times x minus 11. Like that, we know that just based on the fact that this is negative 22. We need to add these together. Mm -hmm. They need to be identical, and they need to come out to be negative 22. No. So only negative 11 plus negative 11 will give us negative 22. But when we multiply those together, we get positive 121. Uh, I keep then I keep wanting to multiply it. And stuff. Multiply what? 11 times 11 and stuff, and, that, and making that negative positive to get negative 22. Ah. I keep getting that mixed up. Well, something we said uh, a couple minutes ago was that this will always have to turn out to be positive because it's always going to be a square number. Yeah. Squares are always positive. Oh, okay. Well, as long as we start out with real numbers. Okay, so you can go ahead and use those. You don't have to pretend like you don't have them. You're going to care about anyways. Okay, bye. Nice quadratic that factors uh, azimuth of square and we, we like perfect squares because we, we we can say square roots. So why don't you go ahead and real quick solve that uh, that quadratic using that square root idea?
we're doing this whole thing. The whole reason why we're learning what we're learning, like how to find this number, goes all the way back to the beginning of class. Why is it nice to have this quantity squared? Take the square root. You can take the square root. Right? So don't be subtracting 121 from both sides. You get a negative 108 or whatever you see it as there. And don't subtract 13 from both sides and then try and factor it. The whole idea was to use the square root. We Show us 121. Why is 121 such a, an awesome number to have in this situation? It makes it into a perfect square. We factor it. It's, it's turned into x minus 11 squared equals 13. Just by finding this number, look, we've made this a perfect square. And what do we get to do now at this stage? Take the square root of both sides. x minus 11 equals plus or minus the square root of 13. One more thing to do, add 11 to both sides, so x equals 11 plus or minus the square root of 13. Done, right? Solutions found. Three steps. nice it, it happened it just so happens that number seven in the homework is set up in such a way that it already was 121 it already was a perfect number to make it a perfect square trinomial so that it factors as a perfect square that's wonderful and now if we don't have that number that ideal number right there then you just need to find it mess with the equation a little bit and uh, you know, make it fit our needs there, or it's zero, I want this to factor as two identical factors. I want it to be identical. I know I need it to add, I need these two numbers to add to eight. So if they're going to add to eight and be identical, what numbers will they be? Four and four. Well, if I had x plus 4 times x plus 4, what would the constant come out to be? 16. 16. So hold on. We just added 16. For good reason, but just out of the blue. You know what I mean? It was, to start with, x squared plus 8x equals negative 1. Now we have x squared plus 8x plus 16. Does that equal negative 1? No. Only x squared plus 8x plus 16. Or 8x, or x squared plus 8x. What do we do about that? Do the same thing to both sides. Equals 15. X plus 4 squared equals 15. Take the square root of both sides. X plus 4 equals plus or minus the square root of 15. X equals negative 4 plus or minus the square root of 15. Hmm. Why does it have 16 squared? Yeah, the, the original equation, if you look at 23 in the homework, was just x squared plus 8x equals negative 1. Oh, okay. okay. To make it factor as x plus 4 times x plus 4, we introduced 16. And so we need to do the same thing to both sides. trying to get um, well practiced at finding this constant right here. Finding that constant right here. 
why are we doing this? Why have we been doing this? Make factor really easy. So easy that it factors as And why is that good? Why is it good to have a perfect square? Take the square root. Take the square root. Okay. We're completing the square. We're finding this ideal number so that our factors are identical. If our factors are identical, we can write it as squared, and we can take the square root. solve an equation, we're just going to rewrite a function. Okay, let me show you what I mean. One. This goes back to um, standard form, vertex form, intercept form. This is in which one of those forms? Well, they're all quadratics, but what form is this thing? Standard. standard form. AX squared plus BX plus C, standard form. Um, well, we learned to write it in intercept form. That was just factor. You factor a quadratic, it's factorable. Now it's in intercept form. Now we can write it in vertex form. The key feature of vertex form is your parentheses squared. Parentheses squared. I might have an A times the parentheses, might be X minus H. squared minus 8x plus 19 is 19. Is going to do it? Is that a good idea? Is we're going to factor? No. No, it's not. When we factor it, we know we're going to have x squared minus 8x. We're going to have x. Right? What, what will these numbers have to be? Four. So they're identical and add to the base. Negative. So we have x minus 4 squared. We're kind of jumping that we need to multiply negative 4 times negative 4 and what would that come? 16. But if we get, if we have 19. What can we do something like that? Subtract 3. Subtract 3 from 19? Okay, from both sides, sure. The thing is though, when we have a, a thing we want to graph, we have a function, we like it to stay y equal. Right, so why don't we just do it all at once, right? If we subtract 3 from 19, it becomes 16 like we want. Well, all I need to have to do is like not change the side at all as far as how much it's worth. So if you subtract 3 and you add 3, does it really do anything? No. No. But if we write it that way, then this is x squared minus 8x plus 16, which factors the way we want. And then we can have a plus 3 on the outside there. 3 plus 3, and we write the vertex form. So rather than having to do negative b over 2a, then take that result, plug it in, so you can find the y value of the vertex, we just have vertex form. It moves over 4, the right 4, moves up 3, vertex, is that 4, 3? Okay. Um, we're going to solve equations. Questions? Yeah. Shall we put away our things and quizzes pass back out? <laughs>